I'm not gonna lie to you, I've never liked the taste of beer. But I didn't know why until I started brewing Mesopotamian beer, which, to my surprise, tasted really good. In this episode, I'll tell you about the origins of beer in the Cradle of Civilization, how I proceeded to brew it from explosions to serving beer live on Channel 4 in Sweden, and getting countless orders from people wanting to buy my beer. Watch until the end when I will taste three of my home-brewed Mesopotamian beers and give you instructions on how to brew them yourself. And if you're anything like me, you might just have found your new favorite drink. Today's sponsor is Table of Gods, a cookbook inspired by the world's oldest recipes written on clay tablets in ancient Mesopotamia 4,000 years ago. If you go to tableofgods.com yt, you can get three of these ancient recipes to cook right away. Flat and fried unleavened stuffed bread offered to the moon god Nana in Ur around 2000 BC, wheat porridge with yogurt, oil and fried mint offered to the god of agriculture Ninurta in 2300 BC, and soft butter cookies with pistachios and date syrup served to the king Zimri Lim around 1800 BC. So beer is probably as old as the agricultural revolution itself. There's still a scholarly debate on whether beer or bread came first, and I will not feed the fire with more fuel. But in any case, the beer humans brewed 10,000 years ago was likely a thick fermented bread liquid, probably not something you'd like to drink or eat today. Determining the exact location of this beer, bread, uh, porridge liquid is worthless, because archaeologists find new evidence all the time. But we can be certain that beer was first made by people living in the Fertile Crescent. At least if we're talking about beer made of barley or wheat, which is normally what we refer to when we talk about beer. But the thing is that we don't know much about Stone Age beer, just as we don't know much about anything that happened before writing was invented. So let's go to the place where writing took off. Uruk 3200 BC, also known as the city of the first superhero Gilgamesh, who I made an entire video about in case you're interested. The first written evidence we have for beer in Uruk is a salary slip, written on a clay tablet describing a payment in beer. Can you guess the sign of the beer? It's the upside down cone. No wonder the Sumerians created the first civilization. I mean, how much more effective wouldn't you work if you got your salary in beer? We also know from other cuneiform sources that the Sumerians divided their beers into different categories, such as ordinary beer, good beer, very good beer, golden beer, red beer, dark beer, and so on. Although the Sumerians were advanced brewers 5,000 years back, beer was likely brewed in homes at this point, and solely by women. Women had always been responsible for the grain storage, making it likely that it actually was a woman who invented beer. A fun fact is that the first recorded chemist was also a woman from Mesopotamia, named Taputi. Taputi made perfumes, however, and not beer. But that's a whole different story. It wasn't until 2700 BC, in the city of Lagash, that the first professional brewery appeared. The brewery had a round oven that was 5 meters or 16 feet and 5 inches in diameter. That's so big you could bake 100 normal-sized pizzas simultaneously in it. I'll get to why they needed this large oven to brew beer later, but for now we can be certain that the brewery in Lagash brewed huge amounts of beer, and that some of it might actually have been delivered to local pubs. Just a few months ago, archaeologists found one of these pubs in Lagash. And the most amazing discovery wasn't that the citizens of Lagash could stroll down the street and order beer 5,000 years ago, but that they could stroll down the street and order a cold beer 5,000 years ago. The pub in Lagash had pits for storing ice and cooling drinks before they were served. So if you thought about ancient people to be ancient, think again. Around 2000 BC, a hymn was written to the beer goddess Ninkasi. Yeah, beer was so holy they had a beer goddess in Mesopotamia. This hymn is not a recipe by modern recipe standards, since it doesn't include any quantities. But it does give us clues about the process of brewing beer. I'll get to that in a minute, but needless to say, beer brewing in Mesopotamia became a lucrative business. People aged 0 to 100 in all social classes enjoyed it. And when the Babylonian king Hammurabi in the 18th century BC wrote his law codes, many of the laws were directly or indirectly connected to beer. And you probably think that Hammurabi, famous for his law An Eye for an Eye, wrote these beer laws in order to control people's intake of the drink. But on the contrary, 
One of these beer laws punishes the brewer who dilutes the beer with water and the punishment was to be thrown in the Euphrates River. And that was not to take a bath. Basically, it was a death sentence. And the message was clear. Do not mess with someone who wants to drink beer. Some thousand years later, in the vast Assyrian Empire, beer brewing was done on such a large scale that the Assyrian king Ashur Nasirpal could offer 100,000 liters of beer at his great feast in Kalhu in 879 BC. Ashur Nasirpal also offered 100,000 liters of wine to his foreign guests, but wine was always inferior to beer in ancient Mesopotamia. There was no wine god or goddess, and the drink was solely for the elite, so the kings, queens, and the gods. But even they preferred beer. Anyway, with the history of beer behind us, let us now talk about how I proceeded to brew ancient Mesopotamian beer. With no experience in fermenting anything, and with an F in chemistry, I started the process. I came across an article written by two students from the University of Helsinki, which I'll link to in the description, and I followed their recipe. I brewed Babylonian date beer in a sealed glass jar from IKEA. And if you know anything about brewing beer, you probably know what happened next. Everything seemed to go fine until day five, when suddenly the jar exploded. I'm not kidding. Fortunately, no one was at home when it exploded in the kitchen. What I didn't understand was that I wasn't even brewing beer. I was fermenting dates with water, which is more like the process of making wine. My second attempt was also to use a glass jar from IKEA. I know, some people never learn, but this time I didn't seal the lid. This meant that no pressure could be built up inside the jar and there was no risk of explosions. The problem with brewing beer this way, however, is that I relied on wild yeast to ferment the beer. And that made the beer mold more often than not. And even when it didn't mold, it tasted sour and just bad. Not at all how it was described in ancient clay tablets, sweet and divine. But brewing with no experience didn't do justice to recreating Mesopotamian beer that was brewed by the best female chemists in the land. So I decided to recruit a female chemist, my sister, Diala. Sorry, this is Diala, but she's named after the river, Diala. As a descendant of the Mesopotamian beer brewers, yep, her DNA points to northern Mesopotamia, Assyria. Diala took it to another level. She bought equipment that didn't explode and yeast that wouldn't mold. We also had several discussions with Tate Paulette, an archaeologist and historian who probably knows more about Mesopotamian beer than anyone in the world. Which is funny because his most common answer when we talked was, we don't know. Which gives perspective to what we're dealing with. We also talked with a beer brewing expert, Diego from Green Daily Brewing in Stockholm. Diego helped us understand what we were currently doing wrong, but also how we could improve our process to recreate something that looked more like Mesopotamian beer, based on all the information we gave him. After talking with Tate and Diego, we used botanical evidence from Mesopotamia for selecting ingredients and literary sources of what beer was described as. And then we started. The process we used to brew our Mesopotamian beer was inspired by the hymn to Ninkasi. Without going through the entire hymn, I'll compare it to modern beer brewing practices to show you the similarities and differences. A simplification of the modern beer brewing process would consist of five steps. Step one is called malting. Barley grains are soaked in water and allowed to germinate. The hymn to Ninkasi reads, Ninkasi, you're the one who soaks the malt in a jar. Step two in the modern beer brewing process is called mashing. The malted barley is crushed and mixed with hot water, which creates a liquid called wort, which is then separated from the grains it was mashed with. The hymn to Ninkasi reads, Ninkasi, you're the one who spreads the cooked mash on large reed mats. You're the one who holds with both hands the great sweet wort. Ninkasi, the filtering vat, which makes a pleasant sound, you place appropriately on a large collector vat. So far, it sounds like the brewers of ancient Mesopotamia copied the modern process of brewing beer today, except they did it 5,000 years ago. Step three in the modern beer brewing process is boiling. The wort is transferred to a kettle and brought to a boil. This is not mentioned in the hymn to Ninkasi, so we asked Tate about it, 
and he said they could have boiled it, but we simply don't know. We decided to boil the wort, however, because it ensures a more stable fermentation process and also extracts more flavors. The fourth step in the modern beer brewing process is cooling. After boiling, the wort needs to be rapidly cooled to prepare it for fermentation. And in the hymn to Ninkasi, there's a line that reads, coolness overcomes. The fifth and last step of this simplified modern beer brewing process is fermenting. The cooled wort is transferred to a fermentation vessel, often a large tank. Then yeast is added to the wort and fermentation begins. In Mesopotamia, they use clay vessels and not tanks, although some vessels could be several hundred liters big. But when it comes to yeast, we don't really know how the brewers of ancient Mesopotamia started the fermentation process. Most likely, they use spontaneous fermentation, which relies on wild yeast present in the environment. That process would probably have developed lactic acid, a bacteria that is commonly used in modern sour beers. So to try to replicate that taste, but in a controlled environment, we relied on a sour yeast with the lactic acid bacteria in it. So, to summarize, the brewers of ancient Mesopotamia brewed beer very similarly to how beer is brewed today. The main difference is in the ingredients. Remember the huge oven from the brewery in Lagash? That oven was used for baking the barley bread called bapir, a unique ingredient present in all Sumerian beers. Bapir could have been used to flavor the beer, or as a fermentation starter, or both. We decided to use it as a flavoring agent. Other unique ingredients in Mesopotamian beer were date syrup, pomegranate syrup, honey, and spices such as coriander, cumin, cardamom, sumac, etc. But maybe the biggest difference compared to modern beers is that Mesopotamian beers totally lacked hops. And I will tell you about the huge difference it makes in a moment because soon we're ready to taste. So, after brewing over and over for six months, we finally made something that tastes good. I had some Swedish beer legends over, including Diego, who tasted it. They liked one of the beers so much, they said I could sell it. Then Sweden's largest news site tasted it and wrote an article about it. I was also invited to Channel 4 in Sweden, where I served the beer to two news anchors on live TV. Honestly, I was a little nervous about their reactions. I mean, what if they threw up or something? It's not like you can edit that out. But fortunately, they liked it too. So what does Mesopotamian beer taste like? And which one did the experts say I could sell? Honey beer, date beer, or pomegranate beer? Make your guess now and hit the subscribe button while you're at it. If you want to brew your own Mesopotamian beer, I provided ingredients, sources, and best practices at tableofgods.com beer, where you can sign up on the waiting list for my upcoming cook and beer book, Table of Gods. I'm starting with the oldest Sumerian honey beer, Spice with fennel. The licorice scent of fennel is definitely there, but I can't really taste it. This is so fresh. It's probably because of the sour yeast that we're using. Uh, maybe also of the honey, I'm, I'm not sure, but the honey definitely gives something to it, but I, ca I can't really notice the sweetness of it, but it's still there somehow. It's hard to explain. Next up is Babylonian date beer. We spiced this with coriander and that's a hit. Because I remember the first times we uh, brewed this, it basically tasted wet horse. I'm not sure if you've had wet horse, but that's not a pleasant taste. The beer is not that sweet, although I can taste dates. You've probably never had unsweetened dates either but that's a bit what this tastes like. Compared to the honey beer, I would say that this is still more on the sweet side rather than the fresh. And the alcohol content is also slightly higher. Our last beer is the pomegranate beer, also known as Alapanu in the ancient Assyrian Empire. The scent is fresh like summary. I think it's in a different league in terms of taste, not necessarily worse or better, 
it just tastes very different from the other two. And I wonder if it's because the pomegranate is just a weird fruit. It's sweet, sour and also bitter. We flavored this beer with cardamom and honey. And I can definitely feel the cardamom all the way from the Indus Valley where it was imported to the Assyrian Empire. The honey, not so much. What's interesting with this type of beer also is that it was usually offered to the kings, queens and the gods. Out of these three beers, the beer experts like the honey beer the most. But we've improved on the date beer and the pomegranate beer since, so it's not certain that they would say the same today. But the question is, how does these beers compare to modern beers? I guess my subjective opinion is of no use, and that's why I've decided to let other people taste it. So in the next episode, I will let people test these three beers and tell you what they think about it. So subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to get notified when the episode is out.